Good, good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, welcome to this uh, very important session. I am personally extremely honored to moderate such a world-class plenary session uh, to discuss uh, a topic of paramount importance and uh, which is very dear to my heart and I believe to all our hearts uh, regarding the future of our Europe. Over the last few months, Europe suffered several setbacks. Politically speaking, at best, it dented the original dream, and at worst, it put it in serious jeopardy. Brexit, of course, and uh, as it looks, in the hard way. But there is as well the Italian referendum and forthcoming election in France, Germany, and the Netherlands not to mention soaring polls for extreme right movement and uh, populism. Recent events also put uh, uh, to the test uh, the European community as a whole, uh, the threat of uh, two-tier United Europe with uh, an economic divide between uh, South and North and the impossibility of a common response to re the refugee crisis. Last but not least, Europe is reminded of geopolitical and um, real political issues. Ukraine is next door, while President Trump's rash comments on NATO and also on Europe raise the issue of European security and defense, as well as the future of Europe. So rather than dwelling on the detail of past hurdles, we look forward and address the question which Europe now. We want to be positive. We believe that we can build a growing, uh, attractive Europe based on its strong values. And uh, as we have learned a lot uh, and many lessons recently, we will uh, obviously cover how can Europe overcome its division and forge a common path forward. As I said, we have on stage an outstanding panel today, Mark Rutte, who is the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Anna Botin, CEO of the banking giant Santander, Martin Schulz, President of the European Parliament until this week, uh, Franz Timmermans, e e EU Commission's first Vice President for better regulation, interinstitutional relations, and um, uh, now we will uh, move to a conversation and I will ask each of the panelists to give his views on uh, the future of Europe. So, Mark, the Netherlands, and I'm not sure you were already born, uh, were one of the six founding members of the European adventure. I remember that vividly, yes. Yes, I know, yeah, and uh, I, I think that uh, you were already there. I was in that meeting. I was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you were one of the signatory. <laughs> and um, when you see all the, the, the current situation and you look forward to Europe, what is your view of the future of Europe and what you think should change in order to build that positive, constructive, and attractive Europe? Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for asking that question, hosting uh, this panel. I think it's a very relevant question. Um, let me start by saying that we need to be very clear why we need Europe uh, at the moment. And of course, there is the need for a European Union which creates jobs and economic uh, security for the future. That's clear. Uh, the other promise of Europe in 1958 was nie wieder Krieg, no more war. Uh, that is still relevant today because the fact that we work together uh, embeds us in a structure, take the Netherlands, 17 million people, uh, a highly developed economy, uh, now with the highest growth rate after uh, Romania and Spain, uh, but still a small country. So we need that embeddedness, the fact that we work together in a structure of 28 countries creates by itself uh, not only a feeling, but also a reality of uh, security, particularly with all the instability with Russia, North of Africa, uh, the war in Syria and all the other instability, uh, instabilities in the world. And thirdly, there is a new issue, which is migration. And last year we were able to um, bring about an agreement with Turkey on, 
on stemming the flow of migrants coming out of Syria through Turkey. In four days, they will be from the south of Turkey into Berlin. Uh, and many people died on the Aegean Sea. We were able to kill that boat smugglers model, etc. So that is positive. At the same time, we have to face at least three big issues which are not helping Europe at the moment. The first is that uh, the main integrating force of Europe is the euro. And the euro is of crucial importance to an economy like the Netherlands. We would have been in very bad shape in 2008 and 2009 with the banking crisis if then the Gilder, the Dutch Gilder, would still have been in place. So the euro has saved us in 2008, 2009. But still the euro is in difficulty because too many countries are not doing what was promised, implementing reforms. Too many countries, particularly in the south of Europe, are not doing that. And that is creating a fundamental distrust within Europe and particularly between the north and the south. And we have to be very open about it. The second one is the integrating power of the internal market. Uh, the internal market is not really existing. It is only there for physical goods. It is not there for services, not there uh, for the digital single market. And that means that we uh, miss out on billions and billions, twice the size of the Dutch economy, if the services and digital single market would be functioning today, twice the size of the Dutch economy. Uh, we are missing out on that. And thirdly, Brexit. Theresa May faced up to reality. I feel in her speech last Tuesday in London. But it also means that UK is now making a choice to control migration and they are paying a huge price because the economic growth rate of the UK will, have, will be impacted negatively by the fact that they will leave the biggest market in the world. So they are willing to pay that price. But it is, has also a consequence for the rest of Europe, but particularly for you, for the UK. Uh, the price between uh, willing to control migration and uh, uh, not uh, uh, accepting and accepting the fact that it will have an impact, a huge impact on the economic growth rate. So I see three op opportunities for this year with the Maltese presidency uh, and the presidencies uh, after that. The first is in migration. We need learning from the uh, agreement we have with Turkey. We need to close deals like with Turkey with the north of Africa. We cannot have people dying on the Mediterranean Sea, many of them not being eligible for asylum anyway. Uh, so we need to close deals like we did with Turkey with the north of Africa. And I'm very happy uh, that Joseph Muscat, the Prime Minister of Malta, is putting this high on the agenda of the Maltese presidency. Secondly, on the digital single market, I was, Frans, I have to be honest, a bit uh, shaken when I read that the Commission is basically uh, not allowing free flow of data and has bowed to French pressure. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to limit the free flow of data. And I believe the freedom to exchange data across borders in the EU is essential to build the single digital market. I know that 20 countries are in agreement with me, so I hope in the European Council we can, uh, 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 we can um, uh, kill this deadlock on this important issue of the, of the creation of the internal uh, digital uh, single market. And finally, on the EU budget, we are now in the middle of discussing the EU budget. I hope and I will fight for an EU budget which is tilting more towards innovation, more towards job creation and less to the economy of the 1980s and the 1990s. We have to bring the EU budget in line with the Europe of 2017. So here we have three opportunities where in 2017 uh, within the overall framework that we don't need more Europe but we need a better functioning Europe. These are three areas where Europe in 2017 could make a positive contribution. Thank you, Mark. As the, the first liberal prime minister since about 100 years, uh, you, you, you are known for liking change. What is the only one change that you would like to see happening in Europe? For France, if you had to say one word. For France and Italy to implement reforms, that's crucial. If they don't do this, uh, my worry is that uh, Europe will be in very difficult Thank you. circumstances. M Martin, uh, Martin, you have spent more than 20 years right at the core of Europe engine, meeting representatives from so many countries. I have one important question before moving to your view of future of Europe. With all these representatives of all the countries, how the European Parliament could have missed the 
the fact that uh, we had a divide between the EU and the population. The citizens of Europe were not really aligned with what was happening. Uh, and as you are saying, all these representatives, what is your view on this? That's a question which is often raised to me, and uh, my answer is always the same. Uh, we have 508 million inhabitants in the European Union, 751 members of the European Parliament. To delegate the responsibility for the dialogue between citizens and uh, the European Union to 751 members of the European Parliament is for sure not feasible. It is quite obvious that everybody says, yeah, but we, we have a parliament and the members of the parliament have to dialogue with the citizens. We do, and uh, I want not all of them. There are some uh, who are sitting in the European parliament with the attempt uh, to destroy the European parliament from inside, getting the salaries to destroy the parliament and getting the salaries from the parliament. One of them is running as a president in France, for example, doing nothing in the legislation. These people you cannot count, so it's less than 750 members. No, the European Union is not a federal state, the government not a, the Commission not a federal government, the Netherlands not a Bundesland of the European Union. The Union is a community of sovereign countries, and citizens in the Netherlands identify European politics, first of all, with what the national government is doing in Brussels. And if the national governments don't take the ownership back and tell to their citizens the European Union are also we, me, Mark Rutte, Angela Merkel, uh, Paolo Gentiloni, or whomever, pa Antonio Costa, sitting in the first row here. We are the responsible people. We stick to what we decide together in the European Council behind closed doors and don't tell to the citizens afterwards returning at home, I was not there. I have nothing to do with this decision. This double game is destroying the European uh, spirit, and therefore the European Parliament is taking that responsibility for dialogue with the citizens. I hope that all members of national governments, and especially the head of states and government, take their responsibility as well. Then we improve the dialogue with uh, the citizens. I disagree with Mark Rutte in one important point. The European Union is as strong as the member states allow that it is. It's not the European Union which has founded the Netherlands or invented the Federal Republic of Germany or created France. It is exactly the other way around. And therefore, what happens, happens on the basis of a treaty which was ratified by all the 28 member states of the European Union. What we are doing in the Commission, what we are doing in the Parliament happens in the frame of a treaty defined by you. And therefore, I want you to consider to be very prudent with this request to some of the member states of the European Union that they have to endorse reforms which are defined by whom? The stability and growth pact. Okay. And for the stability and growth pact is responsible the Eurogroup and the Commission. And not several prime ministers of countries. If we continue to discuss in the way we ask as Germans, as Dutch, as Finns, from the Portuguese or from the Spanish or from the Italians to do what we have done then we create an atmosphere of a battle between countries. I would prefer that the interpretation and the right to interpret the treaty and uh, the rules is really in the hands of the community institutions. If this is not the case, you create, as we suffer it in Germany, an image that the Germans, for example, are giving lessons to other nations. This is, ex is very, in my eyes, very dangerous. So to answer to your question, the title here is to improve the shape of the world. This is the goal of the European Union. In 2050, this is the forecast of uh, experts uh, 
World population will go in the direction of 8 billion inhabitants. The European Union, with 508 million today, less the United Kingdom inhabitants, around 406, 450 million in a foreseeable time, is then less than 1% of world population. No, no. Pardon, no, Germany no. with 82. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. I was already, I, 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 no. I was already one the, the, sentence further. I understand the problem that we have in Europe. We are less than 5%, all Europeans together, less than 5%, and exactly. Germany is less than 1% of world population. Thank you very much to correct me. That means the strongest member state of the European Union, Germany, with 82 million inhabitants, third uh, trade economy in, in the world, is then less than 1% of world population, and the European Union altogether less than 5%. Could somebody tell me how a single country in the worldwide competition in which we are living, with perhaps a tendency to protectionism in some of the important parts of the world, could survive without the European Union. And therefore, I agree with him, we can't uh, tell to our children and their children always only the profit of peace. As important as it may be and remains to be, we must also justify for the future generation the existence of the European Union that only in strengthening uh, ourselves by combining our economic competences and capacities, we are able to defend our uh, model of social and uh, on human values-based uh, society in the 21st century by sticking economically together. This is the justification of the European Union in the 21st century, and I would be happy if all the member states uh, would have the same view. Uh, th th thank you, Martin. Uh, Mark, you want to react? Just quickly, Just quickly. To the point of stability of course, back, I agree with Martin. It should be the Commission to make sure and to be the, guiders, the guidance of the and, and the judge of the stability and growth pact. But look what happens. In the Netherlands, we had to implement over 50 billion euros in savings on a 700 billion economy. We have reformed every sector of society. This has had a huge impact on Dutch society. We are now one of the fastest growing economies, but still people feel hurt. And then people see that to maintain the one integrating force we have in Europe, which is the euro, uh, that other countries are not doing what they promised in terms of the stability and growth pact. And my plea then is, I will pick up on your point, with the Commission to make sure that everybody will abide by the rules, because otherwise uh, we will lose the argument in the countries where we are doing what is necessary. And I'm not talking about Spain. I mean, what the Spain and Spanish government is doing at the moment is huge. They're implementing. But there are too many countries which are, who are not doing what is necessary and therefore not fulfilling on the promise that the euro would bring about a ever higher level of uh, economic growth and uh, a, societal, uh, a positive societal impact. And we are not delivering on that promise. And that, at the end, uh, will have a, a devastating impact on European integration. Th thank you. Uh, Ma Martin, you will not react to this. Uh, we will, you, you will do it uh, later if you wish. Uh, Anna. Anna, you are the executive chairman of one of the largest institutions, and the numbers speak volumes about the size of Santander. 200,000 uh, uh, employees, 124 million customers in Europe and in the Americas, as well as 3.5 million retail shareholders, and by the way, the biggest contributor to universities globally. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is, would you say that the financial crisis and the economic crisis was a trigger or a catalyst that could explain the European disappointment? And uh, you, you, you should be in a good position to answer that question. And uh, you are a citizen of the world. You are from Spain, raised uh, in Europe, living in the UK, having been uh, uh, educated in the US. So you, you have a view which is quite exceptional and if you had to make a few suggestions on how uh, the CEOs and the company can help building a better Europe, what would you say? Okay, um, then I would like to come back to some of the comments made on uh, we will. We will North come back and to South, this. not just Spain. 
but first, I'd like to say that, and this is important, that, you know, and, and I am in absolute agreement with Europe overall has been a success. Let's remember where we're coming from. And I uh, absolutely believe that it's the best model uh, for growth and for inclusive growth. It has given us the longest period of peace and prosperity. Now, the fact that it's the best model doesn't mean it's a perfect model. So I think we need to work to make it uh, work better. Um, and, you know, Spain, Portugal, there's many examples where overall we've made huge progress. Let's remember where, where we are coming from. I also like to say, and it's been sort of hinted at already, is that one thing are European voters, and the other thing are those same Europeans as consumers. And I think most cons uh, people in Europe appreciate, you know, cheap, and safe travel that the European Union has made possible. You know, roaming charges, uh, you know, many of the things we today take for granted are possible because Euro the European Union exists. Uh, climate change is very important. We work together within the Union. It's, it's, it's going to happen faster. So, you know, having said this, we need to change. And if you allow me, you know, I, I, I've been in charge of Santander for two years, and I think uh, if I can share this experience, because I think it's relevant. You know, the first thing we need to change is a common culture, a common purpose and vision. And, you know, again, for us at Santander, we're in many countries. And if I cannot make my Brazilian team, my German team, we're in Germany, in the Nordics, in the UK, have a common purpose and values, and for us it's helping people and businesses prosper and doing things in a way that's simple, personal, and fair for all our Again, I'm not going to get into that. That's for my colleagues on the panel. But I want to leave clear that it's hugely important that we integrate faster integration within the European Union. And for that, we need that part. Now, how can we contribute from the, from the private sector? Um, I think we need change, and we need change now. And, and that's my third point. And timing is everything. We are at the crossroads because of Brexit, because of many things that are happening. Um, and so to make change happen faster, we know what works. You know, uh, I want to say what I said two years ago at a panel at uh, the day that uh, European Central Bank was launching QE, here in Davos actually, we were here. And you know, I said we, there is a four-legged stool, and that is about structural reforms, hugely important. It's about fiscal policy, it's about uh, you know, banking reform, and also about banks helping the economy. So, I'd say, number one, let's finish what we have begun. You know, banking union is hugely important. And I'm sure I'll get some uh, feedback here from my colleagues. Um, we have a common supervision. We have resolution. We need a common deposit insurance. We cannot afford the next crisis without further union. And I know this requires things to be done. Hugely important because banks matter. Most of the credit to SMEs, small companies in Spain or Germany, come from banks. Uh, but I'd like to say two more things. One is that you know, people want to see results today as well as in the future. And you know, just two ideas. One is you know, use us in the private sector more. And let me give you an example of what I mean by this. You know, we've launched several programs, again, UK and Spain, where we work with universities and governments to create jobs at SMEs, small companies hugely successful. We've done 5,000, 10,000 in the UK and Spain where we, where we fund, you know, for three months, university graduates to work at small companies, 50% end up staying in those companies. Why not do 500,000 of these programs across Europe? And I'm sure other business people uh, here and in Europe have similar initiatives where people can see that Europe works for them today. So in summary, Europe works, we need change, and we need change now, and I think we need both the fundamental integration and what I call more active collaboration, not just between countries, but between private sector, public sector, and I guess one last point, which is if, if you ask me what is the one fundamental reform we need, and again, we can do this together, is education. You know, we need lifelong education. People have to be retrained today. We cannot wait. And when I say this, I think we've done a huge, huge progress on education in all countries, but the model has to change. And so this would be my last point on the structural reform education. Sorry, it was a bit too long.
Okay, just in 30 seconds, if you can answer two very short questions. One is about Brexit. We have seen that uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley have announced that they will relocate uh, people, most probably in Frankfurt or Paris, and they believe more Paris because it's more attractive than Frankfurt, but that's my French bias. And the second, uh, you have heard there are many uh, Amsterdam. Uh, yes, cities, maybe like Amsterdam. So we start a competition. Not the city, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and the second question is: Mark pointed out uh, Spain. Maybe you can say one word on Spain case. Sure. So v very shortly, if I may. Very short. So on Brexit, you know, um, how can I say this? I was. Um, you know, I regret the decision. Uh, it was, for me, a sad day. Um, I have lots of friends in the UK. We have a, a big business in the UK. Let me say first, we remain totally committed to the UK. We have 14 million customers, 18,000 employees. So we are a British bank, um, and that is very important. Having said that, you know, we, we know, and this is important, we know it's a clear exit. Now, a clear exit doesn't mean we cannot collaborate and, and cooperate, like the Prime Minister has said. And I think as we work, uh, you know, to make this exit in the best possible way for all, I think we need to think about our customers, about the people of Europe, both on the continent, in the Union, and in the UK. You know, 15 million British people visit Spain. Many millions more go to Portugal, France, Italy. So let's think about the people of Europe and small companies. They're the ones that are trading on both sides. German companies have huge relationships. And so I, I, I th think about the people, about the small companies that are going to have a hard time. And here I'd say that, you know, having a reasonably uh, enough or, let's say, an implementation period that works for people at, and, and companies, it's, it's, it's the most important thing. And on Spain, well, yes, on I have Spain, to answer maybe. that. One word on Spain. So I know that the south of Europe uh, has this image that we spend our time on the beach and, in the case of Spain, going to bullfights and having siestas. You know, that is not true. I promise you. And it's not just me. Uh, I run a, my, our bank in Spain for eight years. I visited uh, this cities around Spain, and I know this is true in Portugal, where we have a bank, people work very hard. And this is hugely important. Every country is good at something. You know, not everybody can be export-led. Some people are going to have to buy German cars, right? And so we need to understand that we need a framework, but then we need to allow for the different things that each one of us in different countries does well. But Spain, like Portugal, like all of the Southern Europe, if you take the overall We've made huge progress. And I have to say the WEF report on inclusion is important. And I'm not very happy when I see Spain and, and, and other Southern European countries being in the, let's say, the bottom quartile of that list. But what's important is that we are on the developed economies list. 25 years ago, we would have been on the developing economies list. So this is very important to see where we're coming from and that we've made, you know, in the case of Spain, from 15,000 to 13,000 GDP per capita. But very importantly, uh, you know, on immigration, you know, we cannot be satisfied until every single person in Spain, in Europe, has a job and a quality job. Having said that, Spain received 5 million immigrants. I'm sure a lot of people in the room don't know this. A country of 40 million people received 5 million immigrants net immigrants between 1999 and 2008, 40 million. Today, we have 18 and a half million people working. And yes, as I said, we have to. But so, so there's a lot of things that Southern Europe has done, and you know, we need to do more. But I think we need to take the positive side and try to make things better. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. France. Uh, France, you, you have been. Uh Foreign Minister of the Netherlands, you are the first uh, Vice President of the Commission. And as you know, the Commission is always considered as the mother of all the problems of Europe. It's the scapegoat of uh, uh, 
the, the guilt uh, of all the issues, all the problem. You are making a lot of directive, including the size of the eggs uh, or what, how we should eat a, a cheese or whatever. What do you think the European Commission should do in order to change her position, her role, her image in Europe? Because today, every single country is pointing finger at the Commission and explaining to the country it's the EU Commission responsibility and fault of what's happening in our country. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> yes, um, I know. That's the reason why I'm you provoking know, you. There is a, we have a running gag at home. Oh. And even my 10-year-old, our youngest daughter, has signed up to it. Whenever somebody knocks over a glass of water, whenever a bike has a flat tire, whenever it starts raining when we're walking the dogs, somebody will say, that's Brussels for you again. Brussels has done this again, you know. So, we, which is become, true, by the and way. Then, and then my oldest son, you know, in the morning when he sees me, he would say, good morning, you faceless, unelected uh, bureaucrat. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing. You, we, we joke about it at home, but it is, of course, um, the, the, the reality of the commission. Now, you can have two reactions to that. Um, and uh, the first is, you know, to adopt, uh, you know, there's a, a, um, a, a rather interesting uh, football club in the UK, in England, called Millwall FC. And their slogan is, nobody loves us, but we don't care. Um, that could be the Commission's response uh, to all of this. And sometimes in the past, I think the Commission had sort of that attitude. We have a task, something to do. They don't like it, but we'll do it anyway. Um, as far as our regulatory responsibilities are concerned, we will have to continue to do that. Because, of course, when we fine a member state, when we interfere in something because it's not in line with the treaty obligations of a member state, mostly the member state will not thank us for it. So, you know, and that's, you have to take that. That's our role, that's our responsibility. You know, like in a football game, uh, you know, if you get a yellow card, you will not say thank you, referee. You probably disagree with him. Um, the other thing is, we've been doing quite a number of things to fix this. You know, we have since the Juncker Commission uh, came into office, we've reduced the amount of proposals by 80%. Um, we have withdrawn more than 100 proposals. We are now um, checking all the proposals with outside partners. Uh, in the refit platform, we have the uh, member states, uh, the public sector, NGOs, checking existing legislation to see what we can remove. We've also, I think, responded quite forcefully in the migration crisis with proposals, with uh, uh, the negotiations we've had with Turkey, with the compacts we're developing, uh, with African countries, et cetera, et cetera. But all of this is neither here nor there. We could mention the energy union, digital single market, all the, but the core problem in European societies is that there is uh, sort of a, an expansion of what I would call moral hazard. You know, you used the term moral hazard in the banking sector before, but there's moral hazard at the core of our societies, if too many people in every single country feel that they've been left behind in global developments in recent years. Take Mark Rutte's country, a country I know rather well. Um, unemployment rates are plummeting. They're, they're reaching 5%. It's at 5.4 now, and it'll probably be even lower uh, this year. They might even have a 3% growth in 2017. And still, at the core of society, people are disgruntled. The middle classes don't feel they are part of the success of the economy. And you can't convince them with statistics. You have to convince them by showing to them that this means something for them. And I truly believe that is at the core of the problem in the European Union. But it would be so easy if we could just blame the Commission. We take the blame if that would mean that everything would be hunky-dory in member states. But institutions in the member states are under exactly the same uh, criticism as we are, perhaps slightly less. Um, and I would echo what Martin said in finishing. The only way we get out of this is if we remove moral hazard from society. If we stop confirming the image that we are just there to make your life difficult. If we can stop confirming the image that it's not the member states' fault what happens in Brussels, 
they take responsibility for that. If we can stop the image that people in the North are just out there to impose an economic model on the South, which is not good for the South, and that people in the South are too lazy to work. These are all lies, but they lead to a huge lack of trust between nations and within nations. And if our societal model is to work for the future, trust is an essential component. We need to bring back trust. We can do our part at the European, as, uh, as European Commission, but it's only a small part, and it will fail if not everyone is on board for this, including the private sector, including NGOs, including society as a whole. So this means that there is a lack of uh, connection and communication with the citizens, which is back to the question that they have put. It looks like uh, uh, there is the commission on its side, the, each member state uh, with its own issues, and there is nothing which is shared in common. Uh, so how can we build a European Union, which is really the, the good of everyone in Europe, and how can we make it happen? Well, how believe... can we rebuild the dream of Europe? I think a lot is, is, is linked to the fact that perhaps sometimes in societies we don't see um, the ideological fight going on because there is a, a huge ideological fight going on within all of our societies between people who seek protection by closing societies which unavoidably leads to limiting freedoms, so that's the price you pay, or, between, or on the other hand, people who believe in, in this globalizing age in an open society, in a diverse society, as a response to the challenges of the future. That is a huge ideological battle, and it's, to me, unclear who will win this. But if the winning side is those people who believe in nationalism, in closing societies, Unavoidably, sooner or later, freedoms will suffer. And you see it in those societies where this is tried, because if you use the word illiberal, illiberal is just, um, you know, is just trying to hide the fact that you mean unfree. And I don't believe Europe needs to move in an unfree direction, frankly. You, you want to react on this? I thought well, that you were a, a couple, nodding. A couple of points, because I, I agree with most what Franz is saying. And let me say, the, the European Commission which came into place in 2014, has indeed been a, has created a huge shift in thinking. Because this whole idea of an ever closer union is now really buried. It's gone. What we now have is a Europe which has to be relevant, and not a sort of project which has uh, a sort of momentum of its own. Um, and I'm, I'm very positive about that. And the fact that uh, under France leadership so many initiatives have been killed and only initiatives at value are accepted to be pushed forward. And, and that's absolutely uh, uh, fantastic. But what we now have to do is to, is to make it relevant and to show to the people that Europe is adding, and it is possible, to controlling migration, to creating more jobs to um, uh, controlling our outer borders. And on all these issues, I see many problems, as I stated in my opening remarks, but I also see opportunities, particularly in 2017. And I believe it is crucial, uh, uh, crucial to work on this. And it is not just a north and south divide, but there is always a risk uh, of a lack of trust between citizens and between countries in the European Union if not everybody is doing what we promised each other we would be doing. It's, it's that simple. Uh, and again, and this is a crucial point, the growth rate of the European Union is not at a high enough level. We are, we are losing to some other big economies. And this is because we are not fulfilling the core promise when we created the euro. And that is that every society being part of the euro would do the necessary stuff to make sure that collectively we will be in the most successful currency zone in the whole world. And that is not happening at the moment. And people are seeing that. And that is hitting the middle classes. That is hitting uh, parts of society. And it is hitting the credibility of the European Union. And the positive of this is that we can counter this. We can overcome this. It's not impossible. What, what we learn in communication and uh, when we work for uh, our clients, we, we see that there is always uh, two aspects. One which is the the rational aspect, and we have seen that rational is not working, and when you explain to the people the rational of the commission, they don't understand, 
and there is the emotional aspect, which is the most important when it comes to citizens. And where there is a big issue today is on the emotional aspect. They don't see, they don't feel that they are belonging to the same community. And uh, Martin, this is uh, one of the points that uh, you, you, you talked about. And I, I think it's important to see how can we reconnect and recreate this connection, this emotional aspect, this link. Tough question? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm... Do you need some help? <laughs> you want to say it in German? I'm hesitating because um, the answer is perhaps the answer to the question how the European Union can survive. And therefore, I'm not, uh, able, I'm not prepared to, 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 to answer spontaneously. We must be... Very okay, maybe I will help you. No, no, you. no, but I understood the question. I'm not so stupid. No, no, I no, 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 I know that you have understood the question. I, 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 maybe I will help you with one question. If you remember Jean Monnet, and I don't know if he said it or if somebody attributed it to him, said, if I had to do it again, I would start with culture. He's right. He was right, and he is right until today. So Marx said, this idea of ever closer union, that's done now. That's wrong. What is the message of Europe? An ever less uh, closer union of countries and citizens? More than ever, we need in the 21st century an ever closer union of citizens in the European Union. Previous generations of heads of states and government came to Brussels and Strasbourg with Helmut Kohl still. A German chancellor, as a young socialist, I fought against. In my eyes today, as a little bit uh, more developed uh, man, a historical personality. Mitterrand and Kohl, by the way, with two very different political concepts at home. A socialist on one hand, Christian Democrat on the other side. They came to Brussels. I was still a young member of the, I was a young member of the European Parliament at that time. And their message was, we are here to strengthen the European Union because we know a strong union is the best protection for our country. Today, I had that privilege to sit in the Council of Heads of States and Government. There are people arriving at the entrance of the building and saying, I am here to defend the interest of my country. As the interests of the country were attacked by the European Union, the same union they are building. This is a dangerous way. If the member state, I repeat it, uh, Mark, will not take back ownership over that idea that the biggest achievement of the second half of the 20th century in Europe, to compare especially with the first half of the 20th century, was that countries and nations across borders cooperate in common institutions who are afraid to balance the very heterogeneous interests, where on equal footing, big and smaller countries, richer or less rich, try to find a fair deal and compromise, saving the face for everybody. Where this idea of countries and nations working across borders instead to build borders and to work against each other is the biggest cultural achievement Europe, in my eyes, ever had during the last centuries. If the heads of states and government, Angela Merkel, Mark Rutte, whoever, Francois Hollande, will not publicly say this, this is our union, based on that idea, then the European Union has no chance for the future. What I expect from leaders in Europe, and you are one of them, is that they not say, this is now over and never close a union. No, in the 21st century, I expect from the leaders that they say, more than ever, we have to stick together. If the leaders will not take that, that, that way, then we are really in a risk. And therefore, Mark, I know that you, from the bottom of your heart, are convinced that this is the right way. No, but I'm then, not. then I'm have the courage to say it. I, I'm not convinced that this is the right way. I'm convinced this is the fastest way to uh, dismantling the European Union. You have a very romantic judgment of history, uh, Martin, and I like that. And you speak about it passionately. 
But the European Union of Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand is not the model on which to build the European Union of the future. It has to be a very pragmatic relationship. Because without the pragmatism and without the collective insight that only by working together we can achieve some of the goals like collective security, a uh, faster growth rate of our economies, the control of our outer borders, of migration, only with acknowledging that fact, which includes that everybody has to do what is necessary to be part of the club. But if we continue about talking that we are step by step moving to some sort of European superstate, Nobody that speaks. is the Nobody fastest speaks. way, Martin, to dismantling the European Nobody. Union. So leave Nobody out those romantic ideas. Uh, it is history. I'm a an historian, and it's always tricky and always a risk uh, to use history as a judge for the future. It's, it's very difficult to predict the future. It is even more difficult to predict the history. Okay, well, I, 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 we will give the floor to Anna because yeah, yeah. we will so bring... I want to say, I think you're both right. And I, and I agree with so both. So you're a banker? No, 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 no. Yes, friends. I promise. So I'm, she is a banker. I'm listening to you. Anyway, and, you know, that's true. Martin, I'd love you to come and do that speech to my team, okay? Because what you're saying about Europe is what I talk, if you allow me again, you know, we have 10 countries from Argentina, Portugal, Germany, and when I took over... The one thing I focus from day one is what is the common culture at Santander? What is our common purpose? So you're right. We need a vision that pulls us all together because Spain, Portugal, Germany, we're different. But I also think we need, at the same time, pragmatic results that people see. We need both. Both are super important. We need ever greater union, integration, finish what we've done. Banking union is important for people, for companies. We cannot afford, and let me tell you, you know, I have a customer in Alicante that does the same thing as a customer in Munich. During the crisis, these two companies were as competitive. One had no funding or had to pay huge rates. The other one had 2% borrowing. This doesn't work. This is what creates, you know, the problems we're seeing today with voters. And this is happening. And so we need ever greater union, pragmatic results that people see, and we need integration and vision and culture. It's hugely important we do both. And on the second one, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I think you know, one thing in Europe we should learn from the Americans is that you know, ask us, you know, we are willing to help. We want to collaborate and help because we talk to millions of people every day. You know, we have five million customers in Germany. Our people talk to them. We can reach them every day, working with governments, working with universities, so that people see an impact. So I think you're both right. Uh, first of all, Martin, no, I, I would I, like to say that I, I am very happy that you took these 10 seconds no, I, I, to, I to think and to give, uh, to put your heart on the table. I disagree. That's very good. I want to repeat, and it's, 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 it's a pity that we are running out of time. I disagree entirely with uh, Mark about my romantic view. It's uh, it was a compliment. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a historian, but uh, I'm uh, a German. One minute. I'm a German. And to say Helmut Kohl's view on Europe was a romantic one, please, give me one minute. 25 years ago, Germany was reunited. The fear also of Dutch people could that what we call German Sonderweg, the two biggest armies in center of Europe, united 1990, 600,000 soldiers, this big country in the center of the continent, going once more in a direction which is not a European one, was the biggest fear of citizens in Europe. And it was Helmut Kohl who said, we want a European Germany and never more a Germanized Europe this is not romanticism. Looking to what happens in Europe today, this is very actual. The enlargement of the European Union to the Eastern country. Could we imagine today Poland, the Baltic countries, not be a part of the European Union, taking in account what happens in Ukraine, about what we would speak today in Europe? I raise that question. This is the wrong... This is, this is not romanticism, an ever closer union of countries with, you are right, pragmatic solutions, I agree. Yeah. 
This is what we need. And therefore, Mark, so maybe, I, my maybe, appeal maybe once more to you, have the listen more your carefully friends. to me. But maybe the Wait. question is, some, sorry, not so much romantic, okay. but we need an emotional appeal. Maybe that's something the Prime Minister can agree. You need to appeal to emotions as well as, you know, to your pocket and your job. So you need, I think you need both. And yep. I think your speech is amazing, we, and I love you to do it to my no, team. Normally we agree Look about at this the, banker but, being a bridge builder here. That's okay. amazing. But, uh, that's what, what, I'm, what, I'm, in my job. what I would like, I what I would like to say, I mean, Mark Rutte and I disagree fundamentally on our vision on the European Union, and that's been the case for 20 years. I do not believe in a purely utilitarian European Union. That doesn't work. We are not in a purely utilitarian phase of our society. The people who think that nationalism and protectionism will bring a solution are not doing this for utilitarian reasons, but for ideological reasons. Absolutely. If you would look at the United Kingdom and Brexit, in a purely utilitarian way, Brexit would never have happened. So there is, that's what I want to reiterate, there is a fundamental ideological confrontation going on in our European Union. And you need to show your cards in this. You need to show your colors. You need to show where you stand. And some of the assumptions of the European right, and especially the liberals, over the last 30 years, if we're talking about history, need to be reassessed. Thatcher was wrong when she said there is no such thing as society. The Liberals were wrong when they said um, the market will take care of everything. The Liberals were wrong when they said trickle-down economics will work. The Liberals were wrong when they said we don't need government anymore. These are the things I hear it here in Davos. Even in Davos, agree with people who would not have agreed with me five years ago agree with me on this. In this fundamental change of the world economy, governance becomes more important than ever before. And this governance will be a different governance than in the past. No more paternalism. You know, that, that was Schumann, uh, etc. Those were very paternalistic people. They said, we will fix Europe, but please don't tell the people how we're going to do it because they won't like it. That paternalism is gone. We need inclusive governance, including the private sector, but we need to understand that this world will not benefit everyone without governance. Okay, it took 50 minutes to finally get every one of you speaking with your heart. Uh, and I thank you for that. And uh, as I was mentioning, one of the biggest issues that Europe is facing is the fact that uh, we are too much about uh, uh, regulation, too much about uh, uh, the, the pragmatic aspect, I'm sorry, Mark, and not enough about the dream, and not enough about the connection, the emotional connection. And uh, in the few minutes which are left, I would like that we, we give to the audience the idea of what we would like all together to build for Europe. What are the great ideas in order to make Europe attractive, make Europe part of uh, uh, the the value of everyone, that everyone feels that they are belong to Europe and Europe is part of their own life. Mark. Well, maybe to, to France always a risk when a socialist starts to assess liberalism, because <laughs> I, I, I don't agree but, with this assessment of liberalism. Let's speak about the future. Exactly. Let's speak about the future. In the spirit Your of, of the time constraint. building a better Europe. Europe, I mean, all this, citizens. But all this romanticism, etc., doesn't work as long as Europe is not delivering results. Agreed. And that is why I'm pleading for a pragmatic approach, because at the moment, the European Union is not delivering the necessary results. So we can talk about vision, we can talk about lofty ideas and about ever closer union. But as long as people are seeing that collectively, this is not the Commission, not the Council, not the European Parliament, collectively, we are not delivering enough jobs, not enough uh, protection of outer borders, not doing enough to uh, fight illegal uh, migration. We can make huge progress on each of these subjects this year in Europe. I'm absolutely convinced that many people want to do this. So I'm not pessimistic about 2017. But we need that pragmatic approach. That is the, the entrance ticket to have a dialogue with your citizens about the pluses and minuses of the European Union. But when Europe is not delivering results, you don't have that entrance ticket to start that dialogue with the citizens. And that is why I'm pleading for a very pragmatic approach and stop the lofty speeches. Okay. Uh, we need to fix those issues, and we all agree. Uh, we have uh, one program which is working beautifully.
beautifully for all the youngsters of Europe, which is Erasmus. Can we think about another program which could be much broader, much larger, and encompass much more people, uh, and that people feel that Europe is part of their lives? Martin? Yeah, we are preparing this Erasmus Plus and the, to enlarge it also to apprentices and, and uh, uh, to the non-academic world. This is uh, extremely important. I agree, nevertheless, for the future of Europe with Mark. We must deliver concrete results. Um, and uh, to give you an answer to what my feeling is for the future, this is absolutely not romantic. It is very pragmatic. We are in Brussels uh, discussing every day about billions. 10 billion here, 50 billion there, 100 billion tomorrow, 30 billion yesterday. For most of our citizens, a million is an enormous amount of money. I think here in the room also. But for 99% of citizens, 1,000 euros is the question of survival. For the rent, for the children, for the clothes, for the car, for the job, for the uh, health care. People have not the feeling that we are discussing about their thousand salary, uh, uh, thousand euros, about their salaries. They think they are, and that's what he means with we must deliver concrete solutions. In the worldwide economy of the 21st century, we cannot deliver such solutions without taking in account, in account that the competition to Europe is not a fair one. Other parts of the world are more competitive than we are, but why? Because they are not respecting our standards. They have not a minimum salary. They have no trade unions. There is no right of strike. There are governments who close the Internet when the opinion of the Internet is not confirming with the line of the government, etc., etc. If they, they don't care about environmental standards or minimum social standards, if they become more competitive than we are because they don't respect our standards, we will defend our model of society only by combining our economic and political forces. Only so Europe can survive in the 21st century. That's the reason why I think Ms. Botin was right. The combination between his pragmatism and my Romanticism. ever closer, Passion. ever Your closer, Passion. Ever closer cooperation of countries and nations across borders is perhaps the Anna. solution. Uh, well, I, I agree with Mr. Schultz, uh, but I think there's one word which is education. And I think we need to work in the same way it's vision and integration and also pragmatism. We need a fundamental review of education. You know, the model is not going to work for the next 50 years. We need to do that fast. We know what works, we have countries, examples. And at the same time, programs like the one I referred to. Why don't we work, instead of you know, 10,000, 500,000 new jobs in small companies, working with universities and private sector? I think those are the two things, and both are linked to education, but making sure that it translates into jobs today. And I think we know how to do that. France? Well, the world is going through fundamental changes, and that, this will affect Europe as much as any other part of the world. As institutions, either you adapt to that or you disappear. Hmm? And nostalgia is the worst possible position to take, looking at past successes, because uh, that's basically what nationalists do. They portray a picture of a nation that was so happy on its own, which is a complete lie. That's not history. But they flee in nostalgia, which will not prepare us for the future. Either we prepare for the future or we become obsolete. This applies to the Commission. This also applies to national institutions. And we need to, to see it as also an ideological confrontation. And let me, let me give you again an example from the country I know best. The government led by Mark Rutte is extremely successful in very concrete results. Unemployment, historical drop in unemployment uh, uh, last year. Uh, economic growth, very high. Um, society is in a good shape. People individually feel quite happy. So why is Mr. Wilders then leading in the polls if results actually convince everyone? This is a big question because he has a proposition based on ideology which says that in, in exclusion of others will protect us. And I think, I think we all need to challenge that assumption. Exclusion of others will lead to unfree societies for all of us. Inclusion 
is the only way forward. And I think if we, as Europeans, commit to that ideology, because I think it's an ideology, whether you're from the right or from the left, we can save the European Union. I think this uh, will be the, the word of conclusion. The European Union is about inclusion. It is about values. It is about emotion. And at the same time, it is about delivering results. And we have to fix everything which is a huge task. So I wish that uh, the future elections will give us the right leaders uh, to build uh, the future of Europe. And we need every one of us to play the rules uh, and to play our role uh, in order to help Europe to become what has to be the light of the world. Thank you.